welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Jane Fonda, Diane Keaton, Candice Bergen, and Mary Steenburgen get together for their book club. Diane Keaton's widower Diane, Jane Fonda's host hell owner Vivian, Candice Bergen's Judge Sharon, and Mary Steenburgen's Carol have been friends for many years, sharing laughs and stories at their book club. When Vivian chooses Fifty Shades of Grey for the latest book, the club find themselves reinvigorated and decide to revive the passion in their lives. Diane begins a relationship with Pilot Mitchell, played by Andy Garcia, Sharon begins to try online dating, Carol tries to spice up her marriage to Craig T. Nelson's Bruce, and Vivian reconnects with the old flame Arthur, played by Don Johnson. It's no secret we are getting older and we are living a lot longer, and if that's the case, then we're going to have to make more movies catering towards that demographic. Hollywood has traditionally aimed their movies very young, because they're the ones with the disposable income, but in recent years we have seen more movies aimed at older audiences, especially in the light of the success of the best exotic Marigold Hotel, which was a huge hit in both the US and the UK. And in Britain in particular, there's been this whole subgenre of movies that are traditionally nicknamed the Grey Pound films because that's what they're aimed at. Movies that bring together ensemble casts of older actors having some laughs and laying their hair down and sometimes are quite flimsy in their construction. I wasn't really a big fan of the best of all at Marigold Hotel but there have been examples of those kind of movies that I have enjoyed in the past but their quality can be wildly variable some are really, really awful. Book Club is definitely an attempt to try and capture the same success on an American audience, and it brings together a whole group of older American actresses. And this is the director debut of Bill Holderman, who himself is fairly interesting because he has risen through the ranks at Robert Redford's production company. He was first an assistant, and now he's a producer. He's produced several of Redford's most recent films, and actually has a writing credit on A Walk in the Woods, and he co-writes the script here, which he also produces, with Erin Sims, who herself is making a writing debut. But make no mistake, Book Club is absolutely awful. Okay, first things first, we've got to talk about the Fifty Shades thing, because that by itself is so very, very odd. This movie could almost function as a 100-minute advert for the Fifty Shades books, in that the message could almost be, if you read the Fifty Shades of Grey books, it will literally change your life. This is odd, however, because the movie looks like it has been made by people who have never read those books and not even bothered to see the films about them. There is the most basic passing knowledge about Fifty Shades of Grey in this movie. The sort of stuff that you would have picked up by cultural osmosis already, and that makes the scenes where they're supposedly discussing it unintentionally hilarious because there are no real insights. I was never remotely convinced that any of these people had read this book. Do you want to know the insights that the book club have about Fifty Shades? Because I can list them on one hand. Uh, one, there's a lot of rumpy pumpy in it. Two, it's a love story, as Jane Fonda infuses, which, um, yeah, technically it is a romance novel, but if you're more familiar with it, you'll know that there's some particularly troubling subtext and abusive themes running all the way through it. And, uh, number three, at least two people quote the Fifty Shades of Effed Up line. That's about it. And I understand what they're trying to do. They're simply using the book as a catalyst. But even so, you would think there would be more specific references than that. I mean, really, the only reason that it's Fifty Shades of Grey is that they're trying to piggyback off its name recognition. Oh, I recognise Fifty Shades of Grey because, really, this movie could have been exactly the same if you just swapped out the book with a Mills and Boone novel. Nothing would change about the movie, none of the scenes, none of the discussions, because they're that surface level. And what's more, Fifty Shades of Grey's moment has passed. We finished the film trilogy last year, so Fifty Shades' moment of cultural infamy is officially over. So right from the outset, this movie feels at least two years out of date in that regard, and everyone and their mum knows about these books, so it's not remotely convincing that any of these people wouldn't know what it's about, or the fact that it contains graphic descriptions of 
S-E-X. Which brings me to my next point, incidentally, when it comes to the handling of that subject, in that this movie could basically be called Innuendos, the movie. It is absolutely filled to the brim with what the BBFC call moderate sex references. They basically get together these high caliber actors to make jokes about their vaginas. This movie has not met a joke too cheap or too obvious for its liking. Its idea of a highbrow gag is that it combines a vagina joke with a Werner Herzog reference. What would a film about your love life be called? Cave of Forgotten Dreams. I half expected one of them to go, hey oh! And the movie is absolutely filled to the brim with that sort of thing. Like Mary Steenburg and she's watering her plants while she's reading the book and looking shocked like this. And there's a meter in it and it zings all the way to wet. Do you get it? Hardy ha ha. Yuck, yuck, yuck. It is that level of sub sitcom humor all the way through this. These are jokes that wouldn't even pass muster on the Big Bang Theory, and yet we have these actors doing it. There's a lot of winking, sort of nudge nudge about the subject, but it's awfully timid about it at the same time. This is a movie where the most it actually gets in regards to that subject is Candice Bergen and Richard Dreyfuss crawling out of the backseat of a car half-dressed and disheveled and covered in lipstick. And that's the most it ever gets in regards to that. That's the most steamy or risque I think the movie really gets. And this isn't a problem with me being a young person having an issue with a movie about older people's love lives. In fact, Diane Keaton has starred in a much better version of this movie, and it was made 15 years ago when it was called Something's Gotta Give. But really, the way that they could have saved this movie, in my opinion, and this was something that I thought about a lot in the movie, because there was a lot of thinking time about this, is that, okay, if you want to discuss these things, go all out. You want to do this? Have them talk about it. Have them be frank. Have them be funny. Have them talk about things that people don't normally talk about in regards to these things. And actually, you know, be a little bit taboo. Be a little bit risque. Actually go for the R rating. They're so coy about the subject that they don't even attempt a bondage joke in regards to Fifty Shades of Grey. They just do a joke about cable ties. Because it's a PG-13 movie, they can't even do anything like that. To make matters worse, even though the movie's called Book Club, there's only three scenes where they actually all get together to discuss it at the beginning of each act. And otherwise, for the most part, the characters are all going on their individual storylines, which is a waste of this cast even further because when they do get together the film does kind of splutteringly come to life because there is a natural chemistry between them you want to see them exchanging dialogue no matter how insipid it is this movie does feel at times like a star-studded version of loose women or the view if you're american and generally it seems that the idea here is basically they're going for an older grayer version of Sex and the City, which makes sense because Candice Bergen was on that show and appeared in the film adaptation. Unfortunately, however, this is something that can barely even discuss that subject. By the way, don't do a drinking game in regards to characters drinking wine, because there is a wine glass in virtually every single scene of this movie. If it's not on a countertop, or on a table, or in a background, it's probably in someone's hand. Red, white, they're going through the whole vineyard. It's beyond parody. Do not attempt that at home. You will die. The fact that they're disbanded for so much of the movie might not have been such a problem if their individual storylines were in any way engaging, but they're not. They're tired old rehashes of plot lines that we've seen in numerous films of this ilk again and again. So Diane Keaton plays Diane. Can you tell they wrote the script for her? And she plays a widower, which is a sentence that I've already had to say in the past year because I saw the dreadful Hampstead where she also played a widower. So her husband has died very suddenly and her daughters want her to move in with them in Scottsdale, Arizona in their basement which they fitted out and made it 
you know, very friendly for her age. There's non-slip floors and there's a, there's a walk-in shower. These daughter characters are total caricatures. They're not even remotely on the planet. There is like this core thought given to these characters. They're very, very protective of, of, a, of their mother and they've turned that up right to 11 so it just becomes wildly grotesque. They overreact to everything. It is unbelievably unsubtle to the point where their mother goes somewhere and doesn't call them back and they call the police. They issue a missing persons because she doesn't answer her phone. That's how over the top this movie gets in that regard. Meanwhile, Diane is having a relationship with a pilot that she meets who played by Andy Garcia. Garcia being one of the relative few bright spots in this movie because even though he's clearly phoning this in, he's still quite charming and so he's quite likeable in this movie in spite of the fact that they bond over jokes about plane crashes. Like that's the running joke in this movie, they keep making jokes about plane crashes to each other. Oh and of course they also bond over the fact that she's very nervous about flying and when she reaches for the armrest she accidentally grabs his crotch. Romance! Jane Fonda probably comes out of this movie the best in that her subplot is the closest the film gets to any kind of emotional honesty and it actually treats her with some dignity and respect which is more than can be said for the rest of the cast having to deal with their stupid subplots and situations the script affords them. She plays Vivian, a hotel manager who has generally forsaken her personal life in favour of her career but even so she's still quite sexually active. She has a lot of one night stands but she's never really settled down with anyone and that kind of stems from the fact that 40 years ago Don Johnson proposed to her and she broke it off and now Johnson has come back into her life and the whole presence of Johnson in this movie is meant to be a big casting in joke because of course his daughter Dakota Johnson was in the Fifty Shades of Grey movies. Which is really kind of weirdly uncomfortable when you think about it, so let's not. But in spite of that, I really like Johnson being in this movie because again, like Garcia, he's effortlessly charming just by presence alone. He's clearly coasting here again, but it really he doesn't have to put that much effort in. I liked him regardless and he does have some nice little chemistry with Fonda on screen. But Dignity is not something the film affords to Candice Bergen who, at least she's a good sport, I'll put it that way because the film's most degrading material is usually foist upon her, unfortunately, which is a real shame. So she's the second character who's kind of forsaken her love life in favour of her career, so she's this big high-powered judge, but we have to do all these scenes where she's in her office dealing with cases, but unfortunately she's signed up for a dating service. In this case, blatant product placement for Bumble. Find love on Bumble will pop up on screen. Find your true love. That's the sort of material that Bergen has to deal with, unfortunately. Or there'll be jokes about her weight. There's a scene where she's squeezed into this undersized pair of Spanx. Like, at least she's game for those jokes, at least, but... Honestly, it's the, it's the real worst material I think anyone has given in this movie. Richard Dreyfuss turns up in the middle of this movie and you think, oh, he's going to be the big main love interest, which he technically is, but he's only in one sequence in the middle of the movie. Once he exits after maybe about two or three scenes, he's gone from the rest of the movie. That, that's a really weird way of going about it. Why Sean is also dragged in in this subplot? Hey, here's a massive paycheck for one day's worth of filming. Why Sean doesn't even do anything funny? He just walks on screen. And that's about it. How low does Burger's material stoop? I'll tell you. They give her a cat because it's that kind of movie so they can have a scene where she goes to the vet and he observes, looks like you got a lethargic pussy. Ha 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 ha, because it's a word for a cat, but it can also refer to lady parts. And if you think that's a feeble double entendre, 
We've got one that almost matches it in the form of Mary Steenburgen's subplot. So Steenburgen plays a woman who's trying to revive her faded marriage to recent retiree Craig T. Nelson. And so she's trying to bring some passion back in that relationship. You can almost write the first scene of this plot by yourself and it's the anniversary dinner. They bought each other gifts and of course he's bought one that's really thoughtless. In this case, Eargasm earplugs to block out his snoring. I half expected him to pull out a bowling ball engraved with H. Simpson on it. It's that trite and predictable, and I reckon the only reason that product placement is there is because it has gasm in it. <sighs> Do you remember that Meryl Streep, Tommy Lee Jones movie a couple of years ago, Hope Springs? That's a way better movie than this, and it was much more honest about this particular subject matter. This is basically a feeble remake of that movie in miniature in this subplot. The problem with their relationship is that Nelson wants to spend more time fixing up his motorcycle because they can make riding jokes. Ha 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 ha. And again, in case you didn't catch all the subtle intricacies of the things that they're playing with, with this metaphor of the motorbike, in the scene where he first brings it up, he walks in on their book club meeting, he walks in, grabs a banana from the fruit bowl and starts eating it because it looks a bit like a trouser slug. Like, honestly. Like, this is the level of the script that we're dealing with here. This is a movie that collectively has four Oscar winners and two Oscar nominees in it. As you can probably tell, this is a very tedious movie to watch and it's terribly directed. There is no sense of pacing to it whatsoever. The first hour has all these cheap jokes back to back with each other, directed in the most heavy handed way you can think of. There's a moment where characters are talking about, oh, someone has to come over to somewhere, but someone says it in the way that well, if that's what it takes to make him come, and they cut to one of the very few black people in this movie in an insert shot going, in case you didn't get it. It's that level all the way through, but once the movie has ran out of that bag of tricks of about an hour in, it completely flatlines. The last half hour of this movie is interminable. I was waiting for this movie to finish at some point and I haven't even gotten into the fact that there is horrible green screen all the way through this movie. Candice Bergen's ex-husband uh, Ed Bagley Jr. he's hooked up with someone new and they're supposed to be in Maui and there's photos on the laptop. It's literally just them sat in front of a green screen in front of this this stock backdrop that looks like the first thing they found on Google image search. It is embarrassing. This is the real kind of amateurish level that the film resides on all the way through it. And then it ends in the flattest way you could possibly imagine. The last scene of this movie doesn't even fizzle. It just stops. It just stops on this incredibly low note. And it doesn't even bring the main cast back together one more time. It just basically just goes over. Unbelievable. This movie is truly, truly atrocious. Book Club manages to be both cringeworthy and embarrassing. Playing like a cross between the best exotic Marigold Hotel and an episode of Sex of the City that's frightened of even discussing sex, the film manages to be a tremendous waste of its multi-Oscar winning cast who are brought together all too infrequently for the few sparks this film has. None of the storylines are engaging and riddled with cliches you've seen in numerous films like this and it seems like the filmmakers were mostly concerned with how many cheeky innuendos they can fit in every single scene with puns so hackneyed and on the nose they would be rejected on a sitcom. Once they run out of those the movie deflates so much that it just crawls to a stop and this is basically an extended ad for the Fifty Shades book made by people who don't appear to have actually read them. Be sure to miss this meeting. If you like this review then you can join my Patreon where you can see my reviews early among other perks but until next time I'm Matthew Buck fading out. Another bottle? Yes!